Okay, today we're going to do two things mainly. Uh, one of them we're going to look at some software. So we're going to look at Mesh Mixer. We kind of did it, um, I don't know, I think maybe even last time we looked at it shortly. Oh, no, no, we looked at it when we redid uh, the photogrammetry things. Um, we brought a model into it there, I believe. Um, but we're going to look at more of that. Uh, it's free. It's a open. Is it open source or just free? It may not be open source, but it's free. Um, it's uh, right here. Meshmixer.com will get you the most recent version. You know, it's a couple of years old still. I don't know if they are uh, planning any new releases or not. But uh, this one will uh, be the one that I'm going to use. Is this 3.5 point whatever the rest of it is. Um, so it's, it's going to be uh, software that we can use to do a variety of things. Here you can kind of see that they've uh, done some uh, support adding. I, I, that's not really what I plan on doing today. Um, they've also done some modifications to this Rabbit model. Um, I think that's maybe one of the built-in models uh, when you download Mesh Mixer that's in there. And then you can do some different techniques to it. Um, so we'll, we'll look at some of the things that you can do in there. There's actually quite a lot that you can do with it. Um, we'll look at that. And then we will also look at 3D printing pins. So, whoops, like this guy, this kind of thing here. Uh, we'll look at that and just kind of what they can be used for um, and if they're useful or not. And if there's something that you want to look at adding to your tool set. Um, so let's go to Mesh Mixer first. Let's do that first. Um, so like I said, it's a free download. I think there's a button. Yeah, download button. And uh, there's a couple of different. Actually, I think when I clicked on this last time, yeah, clicking on it didn't actually do anything. Um, I believe if I did right click and save link as that it would download. Yeah, that's how I got it to download. So um, for some reason, the maybe my <laughs> the internet browser I'm using or whatever, clicking on the button didn't actually do anything. I had to right click and save link as to get it to download. I don't know if there's another button for downloading. Doesn't look like there is, um, but that's how I got it to actually download. Clicking the button didn't seem to really, I mean, it acts like it's gonna do something, but it never actually did anything. So right click, save, as and then you'll get this executable file that will install mesh mixer or it will be mesh mixer um all right so what i'm gonna do with it and you kind of see here's that rabbit oh hold on you're not seeing any of that hold on this button is the one i was talking about if you click on it um nothing happens but if you right click and save link as then it will actually give you the file and up here you can kind of see some of the variety of processes that they've done to this little rabbit um, that model that comes with it so you can kind of get an idea of some of the different things that you can do um, i don't know that we're going to do any of these things but uh, it does kind of show you different uh, techniques that you can use so what we're going to do with mesh mixer is we're going to take the original idea of mesh mixing so maybe you're not super great at modeling really complex shapes you know maybe you know how to do SolidWorks but SolidWorks isn't particularly good at um, things that aren't uh, you know mechanical parts um, it can do things that aren't that way but it's it's much better or at least for the new user it's much better for uh, you know mechanical parts um, but maybe you don't want to make a mechanical part. Maybe you want to make something that's way more on the organic side. SolidWorks can do that, um, but it's not usually not the first thing that you're going to learn how to do in SolidWorks. Um, so maybe you don't have that skill set yet. Now, there are software pieces. Why don't I take a little detour here and show you if you want to model um, from scratch organic things, <clears throat> things that aren't, you know, fillets and holes and faces and things like that, but are things like rabbits, then um, there are pieces of software that are free or at least have free versions that are better at that um, than SolidWorks is, or at least they have a, a workflow designed to do that, uh, where SolidWorks workflow isn't necessarily designed to do that. Uh, Fusion 360 is not necessarily designed to do that mm -hmm. either. Um, you, both of them, you can force to do that, but uh, it 
It's not what they're made to do necessarily. Um, at least in my opinion, I didn't make the software, but uh, if I were describing it, I would say that's not their uh, purpose. So there are pieces of software. One of them is uh, this ZBrush. Now ZBrush, the the actual ZBrush is not free. It's this is a piece of software. Now here, their model that they're showing was actually a mechanical looking model as their first thing. Again, ZBrush originally was not made to create mechanical type models, but um, what it does do is it's sort of like sculpting with clay. Um, and over the years, they have brought in more hard edge modeling type things like this. Um, it gets used a lot in animation. So uh, CGI type stuff. Um, but they, it's, like I said, they don't have a, um, a free version of the entire ZBrush, but they do have, let's see this, I think ZBrush core or core mini. One of those, one of those is free. Yes. The core mini. So ZBrush core mini completely free with an asterisk. Let's see what the asterisk says. Uh, let's see. Oh, for non-commercial use, which this is fine. That's fine. If you just want to build some models and, um, you know, for your own self and print them out, then totally fine to do this now. So this is obviously going to be a scaled down version of ZBrush. Um, but what it does is it gives you a, uh, a ball of clay that you can use digital tools to pinch it and pull it and slice it and cut it and all this kind of different stuff to, um, create, you know, models that are more organic nature. Um, so this would be one way that you could start with uh, a uh, a free, without having to get any uh, funding available, uh, just a, a free model, a uh, clay type modeler. Um, Autodesk has one of these products too. Autodesk Mudbox which I believe, in fact, there's Mudbox versus ZBrush. Uh, I believe you can get, with the educational license, I believe you can get a free version of this also. Um, let's see, where is it gonna be in here? Mudbox. Uh, well, it's actually not even that expensive to purchase, but I believe you can get it uh, if you log in with the education license, you can get it. You can get a lot of different things. And you can kind of see, now this one, um, is not a pared down version uh, Ad blockers going on um, This is the full thing um, So it does have more tools than the ZBrush mini or core mini uh, but it is a uh, Pretty powerful modeler now the this one I would say Is probably a little bit tougher to get started with um, Than the ZBrush core mini they're both they have a lot of different tools in them so that you can get lost easily in there. You would definitely want to watch some sort of intro video to how to do this stuff. Um, but um, it could get you a, a, a tool that's relatively easy to use and possibly free in the education version of Mudbox. And it actually is free in the ZBrush Mini or the Core Mini. Um, there are some other products like this. Um, a, one that takes a totally different approach uh, but may not have it has a free demo, I believe, but um, It is not Totally free after 30 days is this curvy 3d So the idea with this one, let's see if they still have a demo. Yeah, there's a, they have a demo. It's probably a 30-day demo. I believe mm, Let's see 30 days. Yeah uh, So what the idea with this one is so it's curvy 3d uh, the curves refer to you're actually drawing curves on the screen and doing things like revolving them or uh, drawing a shape to extrude it or, or cut it out. So it takes kind of the types of things that you would use in a program like SolidWorks or Fusion 360, but you are drawing those curves. Um, and it has some lofting type features, so you can draw two curves and loft the shape between them. Um, so it takes a different approach. Um, I think to purchase, if you really like this one, to purchase it is not terribly expensive like ZBrush would be. Well, it's $100, so it's it's on the verge. You'd have to really like it, but it does have the 30-day uh, trial for that one. 
Um, a lot of people use this blender. This one is open source and it is a very powerful tool. Um, and it sits somewhere between uh, something like ZBrush and something like um, the Zebra, uh, soft, uh, SolidWorks, Fusion 360, those kind of things. It sits, sits somewhere between those. Um, and there it is right there. You can just download it. Um, it is very powerful. It has a lot of tools. Some people have trouble getting started with it because it does have so much uh, going on. So you definitely have to go and get some uh, documentation. Here's some documentation right here. Uh, or watch some videos to get started. But it is uh, a good tool if you want a lot of power, but you also want to be able to do more of the organic modeling. Um, and you don't want to pay a lot of money to get a tool that does that. Um, Blender is a good, good choice in that in-between uh, part. Um, it has tools like this. Um, so this is a, uh, a node-based uh, random, not randomizer, but uh, algorithm. So for creating things that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe like the surface of this terrain right here that has all these rocks and hills and everything, you can algorithmically produce that versus, uh, you know, going in and modeling every rock. Um, so it has things like that built in. It has, uh, I believe it has a rendering engine as part of it also. I'm not, yeah, here it is, modeling, rigging. So rigging talks about character animation. Um, then there's animation simulation. I haven't used any of their simulation stuff, so I'm not exactly sure what that means. Um, I don't know if it means like finite element simulation. Um, that would be kind of cool if it does. I'll have to look at that. Rendering, so making the, you know, the actual model look realistic or however you want it to look. Um, great for 3D printable object generate. Yes, um, Blender is very good for this, um, particularly if you're not uh, necessarily, it can do dimensions and everything like that. Um, it's not necessarily, that's not its strongest feature, like SolidWorks is really good at that, Fusion 360 is really good at that. Um, but if you're, you know, you can see their demos here, this, this particular type of model would be kind of tough to make in SolidWorks, particularly this uh, root or whatever this is over here with all that surface detail. Pretty hard to do that in SolidWorks, or, or at least not it's not a clean workflow for doing that. Um, compo compositioning, uh, motion tracking, video editing, 2D animation pipeline. So it's a powerful piece of software um, and free and open source. So you can actually, if you know how to uh, code, then you can actually add to it. Um, let's see if there's any others before we get into Mesh Mixer that I want to point out. Um, I'm trying to think of ones that are mainly uh, free, open source, have a, a lengthy demo, things like that. These are probably the, the main ones that I can think of. There are, there are certainly others. There's, there's, um, <laughs> there are CAD modeling programs where you literally write code to model the part. Uh, so open SCAD is like that, uh, where you write stuff that looks like um, computer code and that describes the geometry you're trying to produce. That's really good for um, a model that you want to be parametric, like you need, it needs to grow in size or change some feature, um, but it's, it would not be good for modeling organic things. It would definitely be much better at uh, you know hard edges and patterns and things like that. Um, Let's see. I think these are probably the most ones that I want to speak of. If you have some other tools, put them in the chat, and we'll. I'll, if I know about them, I'll talk about them. Otherwise, I'll just say their name. Um, let's see. Let's go back to the Mesh Mixer. So hopefully, maybe if you want to follow along. Now, I will say that Mesh Mixer, it does have a tendency to crash with large model files. So, in fact, um, when I was uh, using it yesterday... I was, you know, just going through, make sure I still remembered how to do everything in there. Um, and I, it had crashed on me during the thing that I want to do in a minute. So it might crash while we're using it, um, but uh, we'll see. So what I'm going, this is Mesh Mixer. What I'm going to use it for is um, mesh mixing. So finding existing meshes, mixing them together uh, to create something that I want. So uh, Mesh Mixer itself has grown over the years, 
and it has uh, sculpting ability. So sort of now it's um, it's not as uh, designed for this as something like ZBrush or the Mudbox is, but it does have sculpting tools. In fact, you can kind of see it on the logo or the icon for the sculpting. It looks like a ball of clay with a clay hook on it to scrape with. So uh, it, it has tools. I'm not going to be able to click on them until I import a model um, for that. And we'll use some of that. Um, all right. So what I want to do, and there's that rabbit. <laughs> so yeah, that's why a lot of the demos with uh, Mesh Mixer have this rabbit because it's kind of the uh, default object like the teapot in Maya or whatever it is. Um, all right. Let's go to Thingiverse and uh, let's put together a model. So what I have done is go in here. Let's get it in front. And actually, I guess we don't need that. Um, this little guy, this is a scan of a Hero Quest mummy. So Hero Quest was a game back in the mid-90s, 1995. Um, out of print now, but uh, people have gone back with scanners. I think this particular one, I don't know if it tells me, uh, well, no, it says Mummy from Hero Quest Core Set. Um, a lot of these type of scans are made. Um, you remember we did the photogrammetry. Photogrammetry would be tough. This little guy in real life, well, in real plastic life, is like an inch and a half tall. I probably I could go drag one out somewhere, but they're tiny. Um, they're they're smaller than you know this guy was. Um, so they're tiny little things, and photogrammetry would not be good to capture these details. So this is made. I actually think this particular guy um, scans them with a dental scanning tool. Like when you make an impression of a, uh, you know, a tooth or a jawline or whatever, um, they, there are particular tools in dentistry currently that rely heavily on scanning and 3D printing. Um, I don't know if you've seen that or not, but uh, there are you know, many dentist offices have that in-house. Uh, you know, some of them have to send it off they make the impression of your teeth or whatever and send it away. A lot of them do it in-house now. Um, there are uh, printers that print in uh, materials that are used in dentistry. Uh, and so it is actually a, a growing and increasingly growing field. Um, but this guy, I think that's how he scanned him. There are scanners that are capable of this kind of detail. Now, he's not, you know, perfect. He's got a kind of washed out a little bit, but way better than you're going to get some other way, scanning wise. Um, so this, I'm going to get this guy. And so I'm going to download him, which I assume I've already done, but uh, just in case I want to download it again, just so I have it in my downloads thing at the top. Um, and so I want to put him and I want to put him on a round base. So let's find one of these. Um, and I'm just going to get this very first one, I think. Yeah, we'll get the very first one. This is a 25 millimeter base, so inch diameter. Um, and then we're going to put something in his base uh, to give it some character. So we're going to get this rat with these spikes on it. We're going to get him. Now this one, uh, according to their STL, this is two inches. Um, so it's going to be way too big. So we'll have to deal with that over in Mesh Mixer. So this is Mesh Mixing or at least part of mesh mixing. Um, you find some things that, hey, that would look good with that. And then you take them to a program like mesh mixer and you mix them together. So import, we're gonna import from our downloads. Um, start with the mummy guy. There they are. I guess I could have not downloaded them again, but I didn't know if they were still there. So there he is. Um, now I'm gonna put him on a different base so I don't want the base that he came on. Now you can actually see how good this, this scan really is. You can even see the parting line that got picked up from where this guy was cast in plastic. So this is a decent scan for something uh, as small as it really is. Um, so to get rid of this base, there's one tool over here in edit that is a plain cut. I think we actually used this. This might be the one tool that we used in uh, the photogrammetry thing. And it gives you a plane that you can move around. So the little gizmo in the middle here has arrows to move it in those directions. 
and then it has arcs to move it or to rotate the plane. Now in this case, I did I wanted to just want to move it down to where it's leaving his feet but chopping off some of the base. Kind of like that. And so you yeah, you can tell in the video, well, no, that's not right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You can tell um, what's going to be kept and this little kind of faded out blue arrow right here will switch what's going to be kept. Now I'm keeping the base and erasing the mummy. Uh, keeping the mummy erasing the base. So once you get it lined up with where you think is good, then you um, over here are usually where the options for all the tools in Mesh Mixer are going to occur. Um, so I could just slice it and keep both halves if I wanted to, um, or whatever, slice into groups um, so that you could do different things with pieces of the group without actually cutting it apart. Um, or you can cut it apart and throw away half of it. That's what we want to do. Um, and then the fill type is, okay, you're cutting through this model. So what do I do with the surface that I cut? You know, it's going to be open and you could leave it open. Some times that might be a reason to do that. Um, or you can fixed fill, remeshed fill, minimal fill. I'm just going to do the remeshed fill. That will basically put a plane in place of this cutting plane. So his feet won't be hollow on the bottom. So we'll accept that. And then there it is. You can kind of see that's the, that green is the remeshed feel. Um, and I, I left a little bit of the base here, so it must not have been perfectly planar, uh, but it was close. So we could get rid of this with um, some of these sculpting tools would be one way we could get rid of them. <coughs> so here, this is in the sculpt menu. <coughs> you have a set of brushes where you can drag things, add material. Um, you can add material or hold down, I think it's... Oh, I'll have to think. I think it's control uh, and you can subtract material. Um, you can move it around. Uh, you can smooth it. Shift, while you're using one any of these tools, shift goes to your smooth tool. tool. So we can actually do that. Um, if we smooth this, it will kind of eat it away. So that it's... We need to make our uh, cursor a little smaller. So we can kind of do that and eat it away. Maybe that's too small. And let it smooth away to get rid of it. We're going to put this other base on there so we don't have to get rid of this entirely. In fact, if we leave little jibbles, well, where are we at? There's his toes. If we leave little jibbles right here, that could create problems later on um, it, with the slicer. Um, so you kind of don't want to do that. You want to back out Control Z to get rid of a bunch of that. I think it'll be okay. To just leave this since we're putting another base on there but you can get rid of it um, we could use our draw to brush and I think control yeah control subtracts material and I'm holding down the mouse button moving it around um, and without control it's a draw brush again so it adds material so you can kind of subtract and add material that way if you want to um, so we could kind of create a base by doing that if we wanted to. There are some primitives that you can add um, in the mesh mix thing over here, the uh, top icon, you can add it. So we could we could create a cylindrical base right here and just plop it in there. Um, there aren't too many primitives. There are really just a torus, a sphere, a plane, uh, however many, which, whichever one of those that is isohedron or whatever, uh, cylinder, cube, Cone, and of course the rabbit. Um, so let's just say this is we we fiddled with this enough. Maybe actually looking at his foot here, it didn't get as much detail as other parts. You know, you kind of see where his bandages are. Let's go to the sculpt tool again, and let's go to the draw. Let's do draw one. Um, this fall off kind of talks about the shape of the brush, for lack of what better terms. Um, I don't know if I want a hundred strength or not. That's usually you don't want to max out things. Let's see how big our let's make our cursor smaller. We're zoomed in a lot. Maybe not that small. Something like that. And if we hold control, I can kind of reinforce those lines there. So I can chop away and you know kind of reestablish those things. So you can go in here and add some details. You can create entirely new details if you wanted to. Now you do have to remember this guy's going to be 
maybe that big when we print him out. So zoom out occasionally because you can, you know, when you're digital, you can zoom in as close as you want and start creating these tiny little details that are smaller than the nozzle you're using to print with. So uh, don't get lost being too close to the thing. You know, every now and then zoom out to roughly the size it's going to be when it prints. Now you're looking at this on who knows what screen, so I don't know how big it looks to you right now. Um, but to me, it looks about life size. And, you know, don't get too caught up in the tiny details that can't even print. All right. So you can do things like that. Sculpt, add material, subtract material, move. Um, I'm going to show you a different way to move. Uh, you could select this move brush. Let's make it a little larger and try to like reposition it. But you can see that's like, that's not what I wanted. Kind of looks like it's, it's coming unwrapped. Um, but let's say I do want to reposition this arm. Like maybe I want a whole bunch of these things and I want them in different poses. Um, so how you can do that is if we go over to the select menu. So we're gonna, the idea is we're gonna select what we want to move, just the portion we want to move, and then we'll transform that. So select, um, what I'm gonna do, so I'm just gonna start down here on the tip of a knuckle or whatever down here and you could go through these menu items to modify the selection, but they're shortcut keys, which is just the uh, greater than symbol, will expand and less than will subtract the selection. And so that's gonna be a little bit simpler to do. So now I've kind of selected his forearm, more or less. You know, maybe I can go and touch up back here and add a little bit more. Um, oops, I didn't wanna do that though. Um, you can also draw select, so you can draw something, a uh, circle around something you want to select and do that. Um, I did it that way because if you leave any little tiny, like if I left one little piece, it selects cur uh, faces, so individual faces of the STL file. Um, so if I had left one tiny one, it would be left where it is, and then I move the rest of the arm and it makes this big mess. So I use the expand selection to not skip any of the little faces. All right, so now I've got his forearm selected. I'm just gonna try and pull it forwards. So um, what I need to do over here is I have a deform menu, in, it's still in select, um, after I've selected the part that I wanna deform. And there, there's a smooth, so I could just smooth that whole thing out. Um, there's transform, which is literally move, um, and there's soft transform, which kind of gives me a transition. Now it's not gonna be perfect, I won't have to work on it, but it gives me a little transition between where the joint is. So what it does in this area up here. So there's that transform widget. And I'm gonna take the green arc and just kinda position it the way I want. Now obviously this is not gonna work. So I'm gonna, I've gotta move it back in place. Kinda like that. That looks reasonable, you know. Um, let's say I, I do also need to think about, I need to 3D print this guy. And so he's gonna be plastic. Um, I'm probably gonna use an FDM printer. So it's a little bit fragile. Um, plus I would need support if the arm was sticking out like this. So let's actually see if we can get the arm to rest on his leg here so that we can also solve some of our printing issues. It'll stiffen him up a little bit because now he's connected. Um, and I won't have to support this hand. So let's see if we can, let's see, maybe bring it in a little bit, keep his elbow in place, and then we need to rotate it down. Okay, now it's clearly not in the right place, but uh, we're getting close, we're getting close. It, it is touching right there, so that actually would, how those are overlapping would uh, create you know, when I, when I select them, um, the last thing I'm going to do for adding all my geometry together is merge it all together. So this would merge into his leg. Um, so now I still would probably have to have some support on these fingers though, because they're just kind of floating out in the air. So let's do a little bit more. See what one would rotate it kind of around that way. Slide it over. There's pro there would need to be a little bit of support in here, although it is a mummy. So if he's a little raggedy, that's probably okay. But uh, 
Let's, uh oh, all right. So I just, see, I'd already forgotten that it crashes often. It just locked up a little bit. Let's go ahead, save as, and save our mesh mixer project. So this isn't the STL that I would use to print, but it's the project so I can have some kind of history of the work. So let's do a mummy demo and it's gonna be on the desktop, that's fine. All right, so do save it all. It doesn't have an auto save as far as I know. Um, so you do have to do a manual save, but do that often. Um, let's, I wanna think this one a little bit more might have to move it down and back a little bit. We can go and add some little stripes in here, but that looks okay. Maybe a little bit up. That looks okay, and then we accept it. Uh, this fall off over here will modify how much it uh, twists around in the uh, connection point between what we're not moving and what we are transforming. I just left it at the default. So there, now, maybe I don't like exactly, like his hands, his fingers are totally gone. So I'm gonna, uh, oh wait. All right, so this is one thing, there it goes. Control Z does work, but sometimes it's a little bit slow. <laughs> so Control Z to undo, did undo it, but uh, you have to wait a little bit. That looks a lot better. I'm gonna go with that. I didn't like how his fingers just absorbed entirely into his leg. There we go. And they're still they're still joined right there, which will connect them together. Um, and then this actually looks okay, but maybe maybe this is a little too blank for your taste back here. So you go back to sculpt. Um, we'll go to the draw brush and hold. Well, we'll make it a little smaller. and then hold down control and we can kind of reestablish that that's a thing. We could do move. This would be a good place to do move and maybe move a little bit larger area and kind of shift that up a little bit like that. Now see, looking here, I've got this crease. I have a, sh a smooth button if I hold down shift then it kind of just smooths everything out. So I'm just holding down shift and the mouse button and it kind of smooths all that out. Sometimes it can't, like it's trying to create a crease right here, but um, usually it can smooth it out better. Same thing right here. This is a, a little tab, probably where he was connected to the sprue uh, on his uh, plastic model. So we'll smooth that little bump out and then go in there and well, that was that was too much. <laughs> Just erased everything. Kind of put that back. So you you could spend untold amount of time tweaking little details. You know, making details sharper here and there and whatever. So you could you spend all the time you wanted to doing that. Um, let's say that we've got him where we want him. Maybe, we, you know, we finished repositioning. We move this arm or somewhere, maybe tilt his head, lean him forward. I don't know. Um, but you can do all that kind of stuff. And um, we're ready to put him on our base. So if I go back to the icons over here, I have an import. Um, and so it asks me, do I want to uh, replace the current model on the screen, cancel this thing, or append it? So I want to append it, which means keep the current model and add this new one to it. And we're going to do the base now. So this is the base we decided to use. And uh, now I have this object browser that helps me select the different models in my scene. And uh, sometimes you want to work on both of them. Sometimes you want to work on just one of them. Right now we need to move the base over to where his feet are. So I'm just wanting to select the base and edit and transform we'll bring up the little transform thing manipulator and we gotta line it up the way we want it now i'm going to sink his feet into it a little bit so that it's uh he's connected to it now this particular base has you know some uh grout lines in it or whatever which 
are kind of creating these bridging effects. So I'm going to get it more or less where I think it should be, like this, accept it, and then I'm going to go back to sculpt and use my, I think I'll use my flatten, flatten brush, bump it up a little bit and go flatten out. Now I've only got the uh, base selected, so the mummy is not going to have anything happen to him. And I'm just flattening that area underneath his foot to try and, I might actually have to, oh, it's, it's flattening it the wrong way. I'm going to have to add material. So we'll use the draw brush. And we'll just kind of add some material under there so that there's not a, not a little, whoa, whoa, whoa. Not a little uh, valley it's having to bridge across. There's some of his base that's sticking out there. We'll kind of weld that thing in. You know, and again, we're way zoomed in, so zooming out, these are just like little bumps on the floor, so they don't really show up. But I just didn't want to have to make the printer try to bridge across here. So I'm just kind of going underneath the foot and adding material. So I'm doing the add br or the draw brush. And so you can do that until you're satisfied. There's another little section that's got, we could try and also smooth away the, uh, that was on the mummy's original base. You can add some details, you know, make them not so flat if you wanted to. Oh, that, that one doesn't, I don't like that one. Control Z, probably good time to save again. All right. Now let's uh, import a pin. Let's get our little rat in there, the spiky rat. All right, so the meshes in the appended file are positioned far away from the rest of the current scene. So they all have their own origin, and apparently whenever um, somebody made this rat, it's way away from the origin. Um, and it's off of our scene. Would you like Mesh Mission to try and automatically repair this? Sure, why not? So let's see where it put the rat. So you put him over here. Now, over here looks close, but you know, it's actually way, you know, it's way down below the uh, surface here. So let's select the rat, edit, transform, get him up to right-ish level. Definitely way too big. So um, this little, if we hold on the center cube, I can't zoom in on the, the manipulator, it kind of stays the same size. Um, but the, the center cube, then we can scale evenly and we can get him more rat sized. So let's put him over here. Let's, let's make him, I don't know, make him look that way. And let's see if we can get him sitting. He's still floating. Oh, um, if you over here in the options, enable snapping can be, uh, enabled so that he only snaps to, you know, millimeters, I think. Um, a lot of times when you're mesh, mesh mixing, uh, you have to turn this off to get them to exactly where you want it. So let's get him over there, put him on one of these blocks so he's not spanning across one. That actually fits pretty well. I think he's still not quite connected to it. Let's get him there. He's embedded in there. I think he's good now. He don't, doesn't have any floating parts. All right. Accept that, and we can go edit. Maybe we don't want the spikes on there. We go try and get those off or whatever, but we could edit him if we wanted to. Uh, and so then you've got this new, entirely new thing. Like this didn't exist before. It's just the way you want it. Um, file, export, and uh, I think, you know, you actually have some different options here. Ob OBJ format, um, slice, most slicers can read OBJ files. Um, STL files, which is also most, uh, I think all slicers can read STL files. Um, there's the newer 3MF format. That's also a, a newer 3D printing file format. I don't use it very much. Uh, I didn't even know Mesh Mixer could export it. So um, that's new to me. Uh, maybe I'll use that one this time. Um, we'll put him on the desktop and he'll be, uh, oh, wait, hold on. I didn't select everything. So right now I've only got the dire rat, rat selected, so only the rat. Let's select all of our pieces and um, 
combine them. So over here, when I select them all, this menu pops up uh, and I want to combine them. All right. Now, over in my object browser, I have one, one object. I don't have three different objects anymore. So I can't, I can't work on them independently. Um, now, let's export our one object. There are reasons why you might want to keep them separate. If you're doing a two-color print um, or multicolor print or one that has two nozzles or whatever, um, you might want to keep the put them all together like we have them, but keep the models themselves separate so that you can use one color for the base um, and then another color for the mummy and a third color for the rat. You know, you could you could do some multicolor printing uh, with overlapping models that aren't actually merged together. So here's our mummy, we'll call him mummy print. Um, okay, so this is a little warning here. One or more objects being exported is non-manifold. So non-manifold is usually, uh, most slicers can deal with it and fix it in the slicer, but it's better to fix it beforehand. Um, so non-manifold means it's not watertight. So it, it has holes in it somewhere. Fortunately, let's cancel. And there's this analysis button. So the inspector in analysis will inspect my model and look for these holes. Sometimes this, actually that was really fast. So I was about to say, sometimes this takes a while, but it was pretty much instant here. So apparently there's uh, two holes and a error and they're all on the rat's foot. You know, they're, they're showing right in there somewhere. You can kind of see them poking through. Um, auto repair and now he's better, no more errors, done, export. Let's try that 3MF format. And I'm putting him on the desktop. And that's, that's it. I mean, now he is uh, an STL. We could, you know, I don't ever use Prusa Slicer much. Let's, let's use that one this time. I used it because uh, normally it opens fast. There it goes. All right. So it's kind of slow. All right. So it's set up for the Prusa Mini right now. Um, that's another good printer. It, does, it is smaller. It is mini. Um, and it's a cantilever Cartesian coordinate system. Um, but being small, and essentially the, you know, the, um, even the Ender only has one Z motor. It just has some kind of sort of support on the other side. Um, but let's bring in our mummy, mummy print, 3MF file. See how he looks. All right, he came in, object. Okay, I'm not sure why he popped in over there, but he popped in on the side somehow. There he is. Um, now, it does look like he's gonna need support, certainly gonna need support over here, and he would probably need some support or in here it's going to droop otherwise now prusa slicer has this paint on supports so you literally go in and paint the areas you think need supporting oh didn't want that part though i wanted to rotate there we go um there oh, oh the the right click <coughs> is make sure you don't put support there Let's put some support in there. Probably don't need that much. There, a tiny bit might be needed. I ah, can't get to it over there, but I'm just gonna let that go and it'll be fine. Um, so now I've painted where I want supports. Maybe I have blocked. I don't want any supports up there or whatever. Um, the little rat, I think he, I think the Prusa can handle that overhang. So I'm going to leave it alone. Plus it's tiny anyway, so it'll be fine. Um, and then in your supports over here, you go to support on build plate only. So they only grow up from the ground um, everywhere. So they can touch the model at the top and bottom are where you drew them. So I want the support enforcers only. 
Uh, that's fine. Um, oh, we've got it on the tiny detail, 0.1 millimeter detail. So that's about as thin. Um, it does say it goes down to 0.5. I've never actually tried that. Um, that seems like it would not work very well. Typically, on layer heights, you can go down to 25% of your nozzle diameter and up to 75% of your nozzle diameter. So this one's got a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. So I can probably go down to 0.1 and up to 0.3 reasonably well. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think the 05 would work very well with the size nozzle that's on there. I haven't tried it though. Um, Infill is, I can set that at 15%, but I'm actually gonna go over here and use the trick I told you about. Um, I don't know if it's a trick, but uh, on the top, I'm gonna set this to like 999 top layers so that every layer ends up being a top layer. And so that just slow, that makes it solid for one thing, but it also slows down uh, the printing of every layer and it's just uh, tends to work better creating these details on this, uh, how tall is he? Um, 37 millimeter tall model. Uh, slice seam, and let's see how long it says it'll take for the, him to print. Uh, still going. There you can see our support towers that it generated only where we wanted them. Only an hour and a half. That's not crazy. Um, for for a resin print of this guy, that it would take an hour and a half easily. Now the difference is. Um, on the resin printer, I could fill the entire area of that uh, resin print surface um, with, and print them all in an hour and a half versus it's an hour and a half per model on FDM. So there are some advantages, not just in the detail of a, FDM, of, of a resin printer, but in the it does have economy of scale. Um, but... This guy, I, I have printed one of these and I cannot find it. So I'll have to print this one and show you uh, Thursday what he comes out like. But I don't know what I did with the one. He actually came out really well um, at this 0.1 millimeter height. Realizing that he is a mummy so that uh, any, any unevenness kind of just contributes to, you know, what they're supposed to look like anyway. So it, it looked good. Um, I'll print this one and show him on Thursday. Hopefully, I don't lose it again. Um, so that's that's a way to use Mesh Mixer. We didn't even go through all of these. Yeah, there's stamps in here. There's um, other edit tools that we can do. Another thing that um, you could use, maybe, so this guy's really small. Maybe you want to print a really large model um, that doesn't fit on your printer bed. You can use Mesh Mixer to... Uh, slice models precisely uh, and you can even build in locator pins maybe that would be a good thing to show I won't have time to show that today um, but if there's interest in slicing a model uh, a big model into individual pieces with locator pins uh, uh, we can do that we have a couple of open days left or maybe one open day left uh, in the quarter so we could show if there's somebody that wants to know how to do that I could show you how to do that um, all right I'm not going to start printing it right now. Uh, we will let's save. Uh, we will. I'll do that offline and bring it in on Thursday. The other thing that we were going to look at today is 3D printing pins. So I have two. I actually have the original one. So this is the first one, the Three Doodler. It was a Kickstarter. Um, I don't even know how long ago it was, but uh, maybe there's some dates in here somewhere. Let's see if I can find any kind of time frame for this thing. It's been many years. I know that. But I don't see a date on anything here anywhere. But um, this was the first one that was at least the first commercial one. Some people might have like hacked together some stuff. Uh, and, and kind of done this, but um, this was the first one you could buy. And they haven't changed a whole lot other than um, maybe a little bit. They're smaller, so this one's kind of large diameter. Um, this one does let you get pretty close. There's basically just a printer nozzle, uh, a heater in here, 
and you plug it into the wall, well, plug it in over here, that's where the filament goes. You plug it in over here, and this one lets you switch between, are you printing an ABS material or a PLA material, or is it off? Um, and there's a couple of buttons. In this case, there are two buttons um, where you can feed or retract the filament, and most of them have this same stuff. Um, this one also had a mount, so you could actually mount this on uh, a machine to basically try to turn it into a 3D printer. I don't know if anybody ever did that or not, but you could. You could try. Um, it came with a couple of uh, ABS sticks. I've used some of them, but um, you can just use actual printer filament if you want to. Um, these sticks are um, specially formulated to to work a little better in here, but you can use just a roll of filament. It does, most all of these that I know of use the 1.75 millimeter. Here's another one, a little newer, but uh, still a year old probably. We'll, we'll get this one out and use it. Um, so it has a little stand, so you can stick it in there. It has a suction cup on the bottom that probably isn't gonna stick to anything on this table. It uses just a, you know, basically a cell phone charger. It came with patterns to make a couple of things. So, well, a couple of things, bicycle and sunglasses, and a little sheet that you can print directly on. Tiny sample of ABS. Here's some little pieces that I printed before. Some finger protectors so that you don't burn yourself. Little spatula. I'm just going to print, or print, I'm going to do whatever you call this on some tape. I guess you could probably just print straight on here. But since I have this, we'll just make us a little area here. So these, you can use them. You know, originally they were kind of sold as um, you could quickly prototype a shape, you know, a you know, little three-dimensional architectural model or whatever, and, and you can. Um, I don't know that that is actually quicker than printing, but you could make a little case that you don't have to do the modeling. Uh, you just can kind of experiment and explore. So they're kind of for prototyping. Not that strong. Let me get my power over here. I'm gonna be kind of limited on where I can go. All right, so plug her in. We're on PLA, ABS. Those are our two options. Uh, looks like there's some PLA stuck in there already. Oh, I cut my hand. And we will have to wait until the light turns green, I believe. So it gives me a little temperature pretty sure that's Celsius. <clears throat> Let me see if I can, I don't know that it's going to sit. I don't have anywhere to actually weight this thing down. You could, um, if you were, had a station you were working at, you could screw this to the table. It's got a hole for screwing it down. All right. Like I was saying, these are kind of good for prototyping things, but they're better for fixing models. So let's say you have a model and it broke, a plastic model, and it broke. You can weld them back together, or maybe it's a multi-part model to begin with, and you can weld them together with one of these tools pretty easily. Um, and that will end up with a better result than glue. Um, maybe not as good as something like epoxy, uh, just because that's gonna be able to reach into all the little nooks but it will be pretty good. So that's what I think they're more valuable for is re repairing a model. We're getting close to, I don't know how accurate these temperatures are, but we're getting close to extrusion temperature. There we go, no green. So apparently at 175, it lets you extrude. So 
So there it is. I'm gonna have to put some new filament in because you can kind of see it extruding. And you can you can kind of draw on paper. You can go in air. Whoops, pushing the wrong button. All right, let's get that out of there. There's a lag between when you tell it to do something and when it actually does something. So I think I've got the new filament sorted in there. This does obviously get hot, so you have to not But now I didn't uh, really try to melt the other plastic. You could have could have used the hot end of the uh, pen to actually melt some of the yellow plastic, but you know, holds it together. Still haven't got to my new filament yet. Tweezers would probably be nice. But kind of like your welding. Hey, there's the silver. I think I've got a little bit too high of a feed rate right now. There, you can weld. I mean, those are, I'm, I might could break them apart just because it's still soft a little bit, but they're not gonna accidentally come apart. So I think that's maybe their more useful uh, application is for repairing parts that you printed, you know, 17 hours and it failed. And now you've got to print the last two hours of the part and put them together. I think this is probably the best way to actually put them together, assuming that you can get to them. Now, um, the way I did it here, it does create a, you know, a ridge so that if you can't get to the inside to assemble these things uh, or the backside, then you've got to do some sort of cleanup. And this may not be the best method. The best method actually might be, there was an old toy, um, I don't even remember when, in the 70s maybe? Let's see, uh oh, turned it on, stop. Let's see if I can find this this thing. Um, you, can, you can do this with a, you don't have to have this toy. I just uh, remember the toy. Uh, let's get you on the screen. Here we go, plastic friction welder. So this thing can kind of do the same idea um, where you take a little drill, low RPM drill, and uh, it's basically friction stir welding with plastic. Um, and so you can do that. Um, it'll still add a little bit of material, uh, but it will also heat up the existing material better and you'll get a nice um, or less of a bump across the surface here. Like this one, I would kind of, I wouldn't want that on the outside. Um, so it's not a great tool. Why does it keep, let me turn this thing off. Um, it's not a great option if this needs to be on the outside, but if you can get to the inside and do this, then you'll get a super strong bond. Um, if it's ABS and not PLA, then this thing can be sanded down smooth. PLA is so tough to sand uh, flat that I don't know that you'd ever get this very well smooth with PLA. Um, you know, you could have obviously add less material to your weld uh, and maybe get it flat, but this is really good if you're welding something together and you can get to the inner hidden sides of it um, versus having to do it from the outside. 
Um, so I just thought I'd show you this. This I'm not necessarily recommending this particular one. It's just the one that I had that wasn't very expensive. This one, um, there's certainly better ones now than get all this out of the way. The three doodler. I think they still make a three doodler, a newer version. Um, this one was the Tech Boss. You know, there's I don't know how many different versions of these things. They're all basically the same. You just basically want one that uh, can feed and retract. Um, preferably one that will take uh, filament directly. It doesn't have some unique size where you have to buy their filament or whatever. Um, and maybe even one that has two speeds, a slow and a fast. I think this one does have two speeds. Uh, I don't remember which buttons actually control the speed. I think maybe these are the speed and this is feed. I don't remember. Um, I have to re uh, look at the instructions for that. Um, but they're, they're pretty cool to play around with. You can make things from scratch with them. I just find them more useful for um, putting stuff together than making things. In fact, on YouTube, there's some really, like, I don't even know how they did it or how long it took them to do it. Uh, people that make objects with just these pins. Um, and you, they're interesting to watch, but I don't have the patience to make that sort of thing. All right, so that gives us some mesh mixing. Little little intro to these little things. These are not expensive. Typically, you can get one in the you can get them down in the thirty dollar range up to the sixty dollar range probably. Um, I haven't looked today at the prices, but that's typical of what the prices are, somewhere in that range. Um, next time, we should be able to look at the Titan Aqua Agua printer. Um, it should be at least able to do something. I don't know if it'll print or not. Um, we're also going to look at what makes a hot end. You know, so this is a hot end all took a, taken apart. So what are all these pieces? What do they do? What are their jobs? We're going to look at that next time too on Thursday. Um, and then we're really close to wrapping up. I have uh, some G code to work with, and then. Um, Maybe a, if you if, if we want to do another thing on this 19, class 19, class 20 doesn't actually have any content either. So I have some room for more uh, last minute, hey, I want to know about type topics. If you, if you have anything you want to know about, we can put them in there. Otherwise, I will uh, tell you what I want to know about and talk about whatever I think of. Um, but I don't have anything specific that I already think that you need to know about 3D printing. Um, all right. I think I will go over to Zoom, and uh, if you have any questions, we can answer those. Uh, let me know some ideas if you have a particular topic um, that you want to know about in these one of these last two uh, meetings, and we'll see what I can talk about. And uh, I will see you Thursday.